say Volkswagen to you, then the chances are you'll think of the quirky iconic Beetle, the erstwhile Type 2, or maybe Dieselgate. As car brands go, Volkswagen is huge. I mean, last year it was second only to Toyota in terms of sheer car production volume. It churned out 9.31 million cars. Sadly, most of them internal combustion. Today, one of Volkswagen AG's subsidiaries has just unveiled what many are suggesting is the world's first true electric hot hatch with up to 170 kilowatts of power in its most potent version and a sub 6.6 .6 second sprint time. But is it? Today, I'm going to look into the specs of this new hot hatch from the Volkswagen family, explain why it's important in Europe, and ask if it's something that we should all be excited about. First, some history. While well, Volkswagen is big as a car brand, its parent group, Volkswagen AG, is even bigger. In fact, you just won't believe how vastly, hugely, mind-bogglingly big it is. Audi and Porsche are part of the Volkswagen group, which is why Porsche and Audi are using the same J1 platform for the Porsche Taycan and Audi e-tron GT. It's why Volkswagen's ID4 and Audi's Q4 e-tron are essentially the same vehicle underneath, made on the very same platform, in fact. But in addition to these well-known family ties, there's also Bentley and Bugatti, brands which have yet to embrace electric vehicles. Then there's Lamborghini, the company which last week confirmed that all of its high-end vehicles are going plug-in. Then there's Italian motorcycle manufacturer Ducati, a company that Winter made a very good video about here just a few weeks ago. And then there's Scania and MAN trucks, not man, as some of you angrily told me last week, and Volkswagen commercial vehicles. Yeah, I know, it's not an inspired naming. VW was obviously having a bad naming day that day. We all have bad days, right? So far, I've told you the brands that most non-Europeans will know about, but in Europe, there are two more brands you might not associate with Volkswagen, Skoda and Seat. Skoda became part of the Volkswagen Group back in 2000, a merger that was responsible for Skoda's reputation dramatically changing overnight from the jokes of my childhood about wheelbarrows and Eastbock engineering to one for higher-end features at affordable prices. Its buyers have traditionally also skewed towards the more mature end of the market. A Seat, meanwhile, a Spanish brand that Volkswagen took full ownership of in 1990, is aimed at younger buyers and focuses on sporty handling and sporty styling. Its Cupra sub-brand, formerly known as Seat Sport, is a name reserved for Seat's most sporty of models. Which is where the Cupra Born comes in, the car that's just been released by the company and which traditional European automotive journalists are getting very excited about. Why? Well, first, Cupra has a good reputation for making driver-oriented sporty cars that pack decent performance without breaking the bank. And second, because the Cupra Born is based on the very same MEB platform that Volkswagen ID3 is built on, which means it shouldn't be as production constrained as most new-to-market cars out there. Lastly, say its engineers have tweaked the rear-wheel drivetrain of the ID3 to find an extra 27 horsepower, about 20 kilowatts, for the more powerful motor that's not available on the ID3. You will have to specify the e-boost maximum package for that acceleration, but pick it and the mid-range 58 kilowatt hour battery pack, and you'll hit 100 kilometers per hour, 62 miles per hour, in 6.6 .6 seconds. That's three tenths of a second slower than the 2021 Volkswagen Golf GTI, which totally earns it a hot hatch badge. But wait, I am getting a little into the weeds, so let's get back to the top and examine what the Cupra Born has in contrast to the ID3. From a design angle, the Cupra Born looks like an angrier, more intense evil twin to the ID3, just without a goatee. Because the two vehicles share the same platform and underpinnings, the overall shape of both cars is identical, but the Cupra's bonnet and headlight arrangement puts a snarl on the front of the Bourne where the ID3's more neutral face sits. The bonnet also looks to sweep down lower than it does on the ID3 with sharper, sportier lines emphasizing the wheel arches, but if you look closely, you'll see the front part of the bonnet is actually part of the front bumper. It's a clever design trick that makes the Bourne look closer to the road than the ID3 is, but sadly, it is just an illusion. While the interior of both cars have the same arrangement of floating screens, and 
BMW i3 inspired gear selector, the Cupra Born projects broody intensity to contrast the ID3's welcome to the future optimism. It's worth noting that the Born uses a larger 12 inch center touchscreen versus the 10 inch screen of the ID3, and it also has a couple of extra buttons on the steering wheel designed to aid in access to sportier driving modes. The center console in the Born, with cup holders hiding underneath a retractable cover, is visually less fussy than the ID3's open arrangement, and the Born's seats are designed for hugging you a little more completely than the softer, more daily driving oriented seats of the ID3. As for the car's infotainment system, well, aside from size differences, I'd wager that both have almost identical user interfaces and options, but if we're scoring on looks and trim choices alone, the Born looks ready to take your lunch money and ask you to do its homework, while the ID3 is in the cooking club and handed in its homework at the end of class. To the drivetrain. All Cupra Borns will be rear-wheel drives, for now at least, featuring either a 148 horsepower, 110 kilowatt motor, or 201 horsepower, 150 kilowatt motor. Because it shares much of its design with the Volkswagen ID3, the Cupra Born will mimic the ID3's battery pack choices with either 45 kilowatt hour, 58 kilowatt hour, or 77 kilowatt hour packs. All of those figures, by the way, are usable capacity, not nominal capacity. And like the ID3, charging will max out at either 125 kilowatts for the smaller battery or 150 kilowatts for the higher capacity ones. The cheapest born, sadly we don't have sticker prices for any of these yet, will feature the 45 kilowatt hour pack paired to the 110 kilowatt motor, offering an estimated 211 miles or 340 kilometers on the optimistic WLTP test cycle. Matching the performance specs of the ID3 Pure Performance, it does the sprint to 100 clicks, 62 miles per hour, in 8.9 seconds. At the other end of the spectrum will be the longest legged Cupra Born with the larger 150 kilowatt motor and 77 kilowatt hour pack. It will do a claimed 336 miles, 540 kilometers per charge, but if you order one with the optional eBoost performance package, that's the package that adds an extra 20 kilowatts of power, you'll see sprint times drop to seven seconds flat. That's faster than the ID3 Pro Performance that it's closest to in terms of specs. But if you're after maximum performance, you'll want the Cupra Born mid-range pack, which combines the larger motor setup with a 58 kilowatt hour pack. Add eBoost performance package and you'll do the sprint to 100 kilometers per hour in that magic 6.6 .6 seconds. The frustrating thing, it's not available yet. Production will start in September at the same Zweikal production facility in Germany that the ID3 is produced at. And we also don't yet have pricing. That said, expect it to be similar or slightly more expensive than the ID3, with the most expensive variant naturally offering the biggest heart attack for your bank account. Now we've talked about the specs, let's talk about where this fits into the market. Because of its sportier looks, the Cupra Born is going to be more attractive to those who are looking for a sportier ride. And remember, hot hatches are still big in Europe. And with a 0 to 62 time of 6.6 .6 seconds in its quickest variant, I think it will deliver. Interestingly, though, even the most powerful Cupra Born is slower than the IDX engineering prototype we recently saw, so I'd love to see Volkswagen Greenlight it and the Cupra sibling. Is it a hot hatch? Well, the form factor certainly ticks all the boxes. Traditionally, hot hatches have been front wheel drive, so purists will say no, but I suspect this will perform extremely well on the track because of its drivetrain, do away with the traditional torque steer and squirreliness of many a hot hatch I've driven over the years, Including the Chevrolet Bolt, a car that I maintain is as close as most Americans will get to hot hatches this side of the Atlantic, and by the way, is about the same in the stoplight derby as the Bourne. Design-wise, I prefer the Cupra's more aggressive stance and darker interior options, and while boost mode won't be everyone's cup of tea, it's ideal for executing a quick overtake without getting yourself into trouble. I haven't obviously had a chance to ride or drive the Cupra Born, but you know it'll be on my list of cars to try when post-Covid transatlantic travel is possible again. And when I do, I'll share. That's it for today. Please do hit subscribe and that notification bell if you haven't yet, as we think it will stop YouTube from doing weird things with our content. And please also make sure that you subscribe to Transport Evolved Take Two and Transport Evolved Shorts. There are links below, we promise.
Thanks on behalf of the entire TE crew. Go out to the folks on my right for being our $15 to $49 a month Patreon supporters. Special thanks to our $50 a month patrons. That's Guido Drahota, Bromfy Wolf, Anonymous Freak, Raging Fellows, Kyle Hodgson, Gordon C. Paul Conway, Laura Sanborn, Anthony Coates, Denny Hyde, Sean Ueda, and Tesla in the gong. And our deepest gratitude to our $100 a month Patreon supporters, John Lyons, Marcel Ward, Reggie Watts, JP Fagerback, Will Graylin, and Ian. If you'd like to join the ranks of wonderful TE supporters, you'll find links below to Patreon, Bitcoin, and Ko-fi. Point yourself at the TE Discord if you fancy chatting with the team and fans. And if you want to buy some TE swag, just point yourself at our Red Bubble store. We have some really amazing Pride stuff that's just about to go live. Thanks for joining me, and until next time, keep evolving.